Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you all. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. So in 1983, 40 years ago, illusionist and magician David Copperfield set out to perform his biggest trick yet. In the late 70s and early 80s, for a better part of 10 to 15 years, every year David Copperfield had an annual TV special where he would do tricks and illusions that lasted a full hour on national televised TV. And as he led up to his 1983 special, the two previous specials, he did tricks that just amazed people. And one, one special, he, he took a Ferrari and levitated it off the ground. The following year, he felt like he needed to step it up and do something a little bit bigger, and so he took a Learjet and he made it vanish and disappear before people's very eyes. And then in 1983, he's like, I gotta step it up a, a notch. And he set out to make the Statue of Liberty disappear. Anybody remember this? Anybody old enough to remember seeing that, watching that on TV? I mean, it blew people's minds. There was all this hype. Like, how's he going to do it? Is it really possible? People had all these theories how he was going to do it as well. He was going to have helicopters somehow come and take it away, have all of these different like chains hooked up to it and move it. And he was going to have like some elevator and it was going to go down below the ground. People were like, can he really make the whole thing disappear? So what he did, the way he, he set it up was on Liberty Island, he had this platform with a small seating area in the middle. And on either side of the seating area, he had these two large scaffolding towers erected. And the purpose of those towers is they were going to hang a curtain that would cover the Statue of Liberty. And then once he kind of like did his magician gesture, the curtain would drop and the Statue of Liberty would be gone. And he did it. Like he actually did it. And there were people, they had a small audience, maybe 20, 30 people who were there who watched it and they couldn't believe it. They were blown away. Like how in the world did he do it? Now, some people were skeptical. People who were at home watching were skeptical. People who were even on the island were skeptical. But people who saw it happen gave witness and testimony to the amazement of what they saw. And we have a, a clip from the original uh, broadcast of some people's reactions to this Illusion. Go ahead and take a, take a look. What was your reaction? Yes, I was just enchanted. The entire thing, it just disappeared. What happened? Where it gone to? I have no idea. No idea but where it went. It was fascinating to watch it. Describe what you saw. I tell you, if I was home watching on TV, I would be a little, you know, skeptical. But I was here and it was there and now it's not there. I don't know what happened to it. Fantastic. You look like a skeptic. All I know is that when the curtain dropped, the statue was not there and I didn't see it. And how about you? When that curtain went down and there was nothing there, I just couldn't believe it. Your reaction? I was amazed. I don't see it. It was there and it's not there anymore. Uh, do you have any ideas where it went? I have no, no ideas. Idea where no idea. So did you notice how the, the questioning and the responses had a significant undertone of skepticism? Like the one guy said, well, if I was at home, I'd be skeptical, but I was here. I was on the island and I watched and it was gone. The other woman was like, yeah, like I just couldn't believe it. I mean, it was there and then it wasn't. And the, the interviewer is like, you look like a skeptic. You look like a skeptic. And that's why we have this phrase in our culture that we often say that seeing is what? Believing. believing. Seeing is believing. Now, David Copperfield held this secret for how he did it for the longest time. And maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago, he kind of came out and said what he did to make it disappear, or maybe it leaked somehow. And it really, when you kind of learn how he did it, wasn't all that impressive. What he did was he had the platform that the seating area was on simply rotate about 90 degrees. And because they were so low and they were so close and there were these large towers and everything, all that happened was one of the towers, perspective trick, blocked the Statue of Liberty. So when people looked up, the statue was to their left, but what they were looking at, and they couldn't see on either side of them because they had some other barriers there. And then they put the curtain back up, they moved the platform back, dropped the curtain down again, and there it was. I mean, really not all that impressive. Like, I probably could have come up <laughs> with that trick, right? And if you were to try and do it today, it probably wouldn't work because you have more technology like in your pocket, in your phone than they had for a whole network. And somebody probably would have been flying a drone over and you probably would have like blown it all then. 
But seeing is believing. E- even though it, it didn't really disappear, seeing is believing. If you hear of some outrageous report, you're like, there's no way that could be true, and then somebody demonstrates and gives evidence to you that it is true, you're like, oh, I guess it is true, because seeing is believing. Well, most of the time, it is. When it comes to Jesus, sometimes seeing isn't always believing, and that's exactly what John 1 communicates. And this is what we read. This is how John begins. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, from a literary standpoint, what John does to open his gospel is masterful. I mean, it's beautiful, it's elegant, it's poetic, and I don't know if it reads quite the same way in Greek, but in English, you can kind of feel the cadence, you can feel the rhythm, and it almost feels like a spoken word performance rather than just something that was written down. And not only is it masterful from a literary standpoint, but it's also masterful from a theological standpoint. Because in Greek, these first five verses are only 61 words. And in those few words, he displays, one, the preexistence of Jesus before creation, which meant Jesus was Jesus before he was Jesus, right? That's what he's getting at, that Jesus existed as the Son of God before Jesus was ever born. Because when Jesus was born, he wasn't born as full-grown Jesus. He was born as baby Jesus. So that raises the question, if Jesus is from the beginning, what was his form in the beginning? Have you ever thought of that before? Like, that'll blow your mind. And he does that right away. And he's trying to show the significance of this is that Jesus was instrumental in creation. Of what? Everything. He was instrumental in the creation of everything. In the way, the mode that he created everything was by speaking. You go back to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God did what? God said let there be light, and there was. That's why John is comparing Jesus here to the Word, because Jesus, God, speaks things, and they come into being, which then leads to show how God is the originator of all of life, like the implication being He is the originator not only of physical life, but also spiritual life, and how the life that is true life is found, abundant life, as He will call it, is found in Him. And then he uses this image, this contrast, this image of light and dark to to demonstrate how there's this ongoing struggle between good and evil in our world. This cosmic struggle exists, and sometimes it feels like the darkness is winning. Sometimes it feels like the darkness is overtaking you. But with Jesus, the light shines in the darkness, and the, the light will always be victorious. He does all of that. He explains all of that in 61 words. I mean, his gospel opens with a colossal mic drop, and it's like, I'm just getting started. He does more with 61 words, a small paragraph, than most people do with a full chapter. And what the start of his gospel does, because it's so beautifully and magnificently written, is it points to the beauty and the majesty of God of how amazing and awe-inspiring he is. And what John is trying to show in this first chapter of his gospel is how this powerful, good, gracious creator who made all things and has life flowing in and through him to the rest of the world, how that God is coming near to us. He comes to us to be with us. If we jump down to verse 9, that's what he's saying. The true light, carrying that image of light and darkness forward, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. When I was in high school, 
um, I, I played football, and at the end of every football season, we had a, a football banquet where, you know, you kind of get dressed up in whatever nice clothes you have for like a, a high school student, which usually was like non-dirty jeans and a, a button-down shirt that may or may not have been tucked in. And you, you go to the, the school gymnasium, and they have tables set everywhere, and they have dinner for everybody, and they have this big, long table at the front of the room where all the coaches sit, and this is like freshman, JV, and varsity football. And we're just having this banquet and we eat dinner and then awards are starting to be given out by all the teams and coaches come up and they give awards to all the players. And what we, what we didn't know at that time was that Al Gore was actually in the building of our school. This was 1999, right? The fall before the 2000 presidential race and it was leading up to the primaries, right? Primary season. And New Hampshire is significant because New Hampshire has the first primary of all the primaries in our country. And so whenever political campaign season came around, my hometown was like this place where all politicians went because it's this quintessential New England town. Cute Main Street right in the middle of town that led right up to a traffic circle that had a big white church with a white steeple, a gazebo in the middle. And it was always a place where politicians would go to hold a rally in downtown Keene, New Hampshire, saying, we're going to change the world. There's a picture of Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton in some downtown diner, Lindy's Diner, in Keene. New Hampshire, just campaigning and talking to common folk, right? So Keene was a place where politicians would go, and Al Gore was there campaigning for his 2000 presidential run, and he was holding a rally later that week, and the school was just a place that afternoon where he had, like, meetings and stuff. And so he hears that this group of a few hundred people are in the, you know, the cafeteria having uh, this banquet, and what does he do? He seizes the opportunity, and he walks right in, in the middle of the banquet, in the middle of all the awards. And he just walks right in, and instantly, when people realize, like, I was sitting on the far side of the room, and all of a sudden, like, people start standing up and applauding, and I'm like, what is going on? And then I see Al Gore just trot right through the middle of the room. He goes right, doesn't ask permission, just goes right up to the podium, kind of like pushes the coach out of the way and starts to give this speech about how this is great, you young men are doing this. And everybody's just losing their mind. Says what he wants to say, I'd love your support, and then he walks out, right? When someone like Al Gore shows up and makes an entrance, it's just like all of this attention, all of this fanfare. And you would think that Jesus, being the king of kings, the true light that gives light to all mankind, as he was coming into the world, you would think that he would receive a reception like that. I mean, even from people who weren't crazy about him, because certainly in that room of a few hundred people, there were people who weren't crazy about Al Gore, but everybody, everybody was on their feet. Everybody was clapping. Everybody was showing respect. You would think that Jesus, being the true king of kings, as he comes near to those he loves, would receive a parade would re receive some sort of pep rally, would receive all of this recognition and applause, but this is what we read in verse 10 as to how people responded when he arrived. Verse 10, he was in the world. The true light that gives light to all mankind was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Everything up to this point in John chapter 1 is John, or Jesus, trying to make himself known. It's not as though he goes into the world the way celebrities go into the world, because how do they go out into the world? They go out in disguise, incognito. They got the big floppy hat, the big glasses, the scarf, the big jacket pulled up, so people don't see them, so they aren't disrupted or interrupted in what they're doing. Jesus doesn't do any of that. He comes and says, hey, I'm here. We're told in verse 6 through 8 that he even had a guy go before him, John the Baptist. Now there was a man sent from God whose name was John who came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that everyone, who? Everyone would believe. Like the implication is like Jesus was coming so that the whole world would know he is here. But yet the world did not recognize him. You would think he would have surefire success, especially... After verse 5 says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overtake it. The light always wins. So surely people would see and recognize Jesus. But with Jesus, seeing isn't 
always believing, in part because sometimes many people are looking for the wrong thing. They're looking for the wrong thing and looking for it in the wrong place. See, Jesus came as Israel's Messiah. Now, Israel was looking for their Messiah. They were awaiting a Messiah, but what they thought they were going to get is a political powerhouse, somebody who would garner support, somebody who would rally the troops, somebody who would storm the capital and say, this is our time, this is our place, right? But instead, they got a guy who was meek and lowly, who hung out with outcasts and sinners, who for many of his years was unknown, dismissed, marginalized, and ultimately crucified. They were looking for the wrong thing in the wrong place. And in our day and age, many people aren't looking for a savior because many people feel like they don't need a savior. They are their own savior. But many people are looking for life, the life that is true life. And what we read is that that life is found in Jesus. And so the question for us is, what is our vision of true living? Like if I do that, if I achieve that, if I can accomplish that, if I can get that in my life, then oh, life will be worth living. What is that for you? What is your vision and version of ultimate living? What is that? And how's that going for you? Is it truly satisfying you? See, everybody has a certain perception of what true living is, and they think if I can accomplish that and achieve that, my life will be complete, and I will experience lasting fulfillment in joy. But the longer you've lived, the longer you've pursued that thing, and if you've actually acquired that thing or achieved that thing, you know that that satisfaction lasts for about 15 minutes. And then you're like, what else? What's next? So what is it that you're looking for? And where are you looking for it? Now, verse 10 implies that... Um, the people didn't recognize Jesus. And kind of like sounds like that's a passive recognition. Like, oh, I just, I didn't know. I didn't know it was him. And almost like it's not their fault. Like, how am I supposed to know something I don't know? I don't know what I don't know. So whose fault is it? I just didn't recognize him. But as you move into verse 11, you come to see that it's a little bit more, it wasn't just that they didn't recognize him. Their recognition actually falls along with rejection because it says in verse 11, he came to that which was his own. Have you ever experienced this sense of like, oh, when you're with a certain group of people, you're like, these people are my people. Have you ever felt that before? Like they just get me, they know me. There's this unspoken reality. And the first time you meet them, you're like, oh, these people are my people. When when Becky and I moved here in 2016, the year leading up to it, we were discerning what our next call would be. And one of the things we were looking for was the who over the what. Meaning the what's always going to change. The work that you do is always going to change. There are realities of our ministry, the what, that are going to change. But one of the things that sustains you through the change of the what is the who. That these are my people. That I'm in it with them. And I desire to be with them because there's this mutual understanding. And I'll never forget when we came here to Meadowbrook for our first visit. We had looked at churches in North Carolina and Arizona, and there was this disconnect. It doesn't feel like these people are our who, but when we came here, the sentiment that Becky and I had when we left was that this is it. Like, these are our people. It wasn't necessarily like what was happening at the church. It wasn't so much about the city. It was like the people of Meadowbrook. Like, there's just this synergy there. These people are our people. And what verse 11 is saying is Jesus came to his who. Jesus came to that which was his own. These were his own people. It wasn't as though he was going to a foreign country. It wasn't as though he was going to a neighboring world next door. He came to his own. But his own did not receive him. See, verse 11 highlights that it wasn't so much like, oh, we we just didn't know that Jesus was Jesus. We didn't didn't recognize him. But it's more along the lines, yeah, we, we know who he is. And we don't want him to be 
one of us. We don't want him in our group. The receiving, the not receiving of the, the people of the world is more along the lines of rejection rather than, oh, we just didn't recognize him. And rejection is one of the worst feelings ever. I would imagine if you, you sat long enough and kind of thought back through your life, you could find moments where you were rejected, you were passed over, you were left behind, and man, there's a world of hurt that's stored up with that, isn't there? And some of us have experienced really big loss and rejection. And this time of year just like brings it all back up. And sometimes it happens in little things, and those little things point to bigger things. Um, I, I've been off of social media over the last six months. I decided to go off before my sabbatical. I just thought that would be a good way to take a break. And when I came back from sabbatical, I was like, I don't miss it. Like, I, don't, I don't miss it at all, right? So what does that say about our world and social media? So I thought I'd like post another, I, I made a post before I went on sabbatical, I'm going off social media, and then I was like, oh, I probably need to let the world know I'm still not on social media, like people care, right? Like people are living their lives, like I wonder if Brian's back on social media. So for whatever reason, I got back on and I posted again, I'm still not on social media, right? <laughs> Those are the two posts that I've done in the last six months. And while I was on Instagram posting my non-post or whatever, I was like, oh, I wonder what else is happening here. And so I started just scrolling through Instagram a little bit, and I came across this post of a pastor friend of him with a group of about 12 pastors. And they were all doing this, like, ad, this collaborative Advent video thing that they were going to post online or whatever, and I started flipping through the different, swiping through the different photos. I'm like, oh, I know that guy, and I know that guy, and I know that guy. And then it dawns on me, like, why wasn't I invited to this thing? <laughs> Like, like, why didn't I get the invitation to be a part of this thing? And even though it was just like a little thing, like I felt this sense of rejection. I was like, oh, this makes me sad. And I'm like, there's shame there. I'm like, this is why social media is bad for the world. It makes you feel sad all the time, right? But like we live in a world where rejection is constant. And maybe you're here this morning and you're feeling it. You're feeling, you're sitting in that rejection of some kind, some way. And if that is you this morning... Like this Christmas season and the message of Christmas is good news. And the good news comes in verse 12 because it says, Yet to all who did receive him, even though the world is re rejecting Jesus, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, here's the verse we talked about earlier for all you kids, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. See, essentially, Jesus comes into the world knowing he will be rejected so that we might be received. Jesus was rejected so that we could be received. And what we are received as is his children. And there's three things that you receive when you are received as his children. The first is identity. You get a deeper sense of who you are because we so often believe that identity is wrapped up in what we do and what we achieve and what we accomplish. But what we learn in Jesus is that identity is truly found in where we belong. It's not about what you achieve, but it's about where you belong and to whom you belong. You receive a sense of identity when you're connected to Jesus because you realize it's like, oh, his life is mine. The other thing you, you receive is authority. The Greek word, when it says that he gave you the right to be children of God, the Greek word there is exousia, which translates to power or authority. He gave you the authority. You have authority as God's child. He, he's, he's going to give you and has given you the keys to the kingdom. It's like, I'm turning over the family business to you. You are in charge because he's not here. Like, he's with the Father. We have his spirit with us, but he has left us with work to do, and we have the authority to carry out that work. And the other thing you receive is security. You have security because it says in 1 Peter 4 that we have this inheritance that, we're, that will never spoil, perish, or fade. We have security in who we are. And, and it all starts with being found in Jesus. Our identity, our authority, and our security is wrapped up with whom we belong, not in and of ourselves. There's this kid's book that I used to read when I was younger 
called, Are You My Mother? with a question mark at the end. Anybody remember this book? It's the story of this little, little bird who's hatched out of his egg, and when he hatches out of his egg, he's in a nest all by himself. His, his mom isn't there, no siblings around. So he leaves the, the nest to go find his mother, and he goes to all of these different like, objects and animals. He goes to a cat, and he asks the cat, Are you my mother? And the cat says, No, 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 I, I'm not your mother. And, and then from there, he goes to a cow, and he says to the cow, or, Are you my mother? All along the way, asking this question in each individual or, or object or thing responds back, no, I'm not your mother. He goes to a digger, and then he goes to a dog all the way asking, are you my mother? He can't find his mother anywhere, and he's distraught. He doesn't know what else to do, so he goes back to the nest, and when he gets back to the nest, his mother is there, and he doesn't have to ask. He just instinctively says, oh, you're my mother. He recognizes his mother in part because there's an image-bearing quality to their relationship. We have an image-bearing quality to our relationship with God. And we understand who He fully is. We can see ourselves in it. It's like, ah, oh, that's where I belong. So why would I reject that? When my heart is telling me that's what I long for, my identity, my authority, and my security are all wrapped up in Him. And He was rejected so that we might be received. He comes near to us wanting to be in relationship with us so that we can learn who we fully are and what we were created for. So maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, you know, I would love to be able to recognize Jesus in my daily life. It says the world did not recognize him. You're like, I would love to recognize him. How do I do that? How do I have eyes to see that Jesus, because the, the Bible says that God is present and at work. Jesus is present and constantly at work in your life. The question is, do you have eyes to see it? And you might be thinking like, Brian, how do I have the time to do that? Because what you need is space and time. The way you cultivate eyes to see that God is present with you, and the way you cultivate eyes to recognize him in your life, is you create space. And you might be like, I have no space. Like this season especially. Well, the question is, where can you be creative with space? Like meaning... When you're running errands, maybe it's just sitting in the car, two minutes from point A to point B. Or, or if you're walking your dog, if you have a dog and you walk your dog, I'm quick to turn on music in the car, put on a podcast, or put something in my ears to drown out the silence. But maybe you just sit in that. And you ask God one question. Let this be your prayer. God, show me where you are. God, give me eyes to see. If you earnestly pray that and practice being on the lookout for that, he'll show you where he is in your life. And the invitation is to create space for him. Now, maybe you're here this morning and you've just dismissed Jesus. You've, you've full out rejected him. You've just said like, uh-uh, that's silly. That's weird religious stuff. And I don't even know why I'm here this morning. A friend dragged me to church, right? The good news and the invitation is that Jesus receives those who reject him. Jesus receives those who reject him because he knows that when you turn back to him with a sincere heart, you will find what your heart is looking for. And so the question is, how do you get to know him? Well, what we're doing this Advent season is we're starting on a journey through the Gospel of John, and we've been saying, we're just making little copy, copies of the Gospel of John available. You can get them at the Connection Center. You can get one for yourself. You can get one for a friend. I mean, you could read this in a few hours less than that, an hour, right? It's like 60-some small pages. And the question you ask when you read through the Gospel of John is, what do I think of Jesus? Not what do I think of religion, what do I think of Christianity? What do I think of Jesus? My hope is that as we study this book together as a church, we would find like, wow, he's way more surprising than I ever would have thought. He's way more inviting and intriguing than I could ever imagine. And he has something my heart so deeply longs for. Because in those places where I feel rejected in this world, he understands my rejection because he went through it himself. And in, my reje in his rejection, he receives me. He was rejected so that we might be received. So the question is, 
Are you looking for him? Do you have eyes that can see him? Are you able to recognize him? Are you creating space in your life to receive him? So may you, this Christmas season, recognize Jesus in your daily life. May you rest in your identity as a child of God, and may you receive all that he has to give. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and your graciousness. Lord, we thank you that you are pursuing us, that you have come near to us, that you have sought us out, knowing that all the while we would turn our back on you. But you relentlessly pursue us so that we might have and we might experience the goodness and grace that you long to give. And so, Lord, we ask this Christmas season that we would have eyes to see, we would have ears that can hear, and we would have a heart that is open to receiving what you have to give. pray this in your name. Amen.